Well, good evening, everybody. I am not Beth Irwin. <laughs> My name is Cindy Chrysler. I'm vice president. Beth couldn't be here tonight, so I'm stepping in for her. Um, tonight, our speaker is Brian Laughlin. He's going to talk on Cacti of Texas. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Uh, we have a new website, just a few announcements before our speaker. Uh, we have a new website, it's nipsotwilco.org. And thank you to Pat Donica, who created it, did all the fancy bells and whistles for this. So check out our new website. All our old information is on there, but just a new, new website. I uh, wanted to highlight the field trips that we have coming up, especially the April 29th field trip to the Phil Hardberger Park in San Antonio. This is the park that has the land bridge, and we're going to have a two-hour guided hike. And I really, really encourage you to make that drive down to San Antonio. I know it's kind of a long slog. Uh, for those of you who happen to be master naturalists, this will count as two hours of advanced training if you attend this hike. Um, afterwards, we are going to go eat Mexican food because we're going to be in San Antonio. What else do you eat down there? But I really am thrilled uh, about this opportunity to go to the park and have a guided hike by their education course. Coordinator. So check out, I'm sorry. You do need to register. Go to the website, uh, click on the information about that. We just need a head count so we can tell them if we get over a certain number, they want to have two people uh, so we have enough uh, guides for the hikers. Yes, ma'am. Also, on the Thursday night before this, yes. there is going to be a Zoom presentation on the Phil Hardbarger Park. Uh, if you'll check your nips off. Okay. I think the uh, chapter. Okay. The New Braunfels chapter. For those of you online, uh, the Thursday night before we go down on April 29th is an online presentation with the Lindheimer Nipsot chapter. So check out uh, if you get the emails from uh, the state Nipsot uh, people, uh, it'll have that information on there. Um, in August, we will go back to Hidden Springs and do our eighth of 12 plant surveys. Uh, Hidden Springs is not open to the public, so this is a rare chance for you to be able to go. You do not have to be a NIPSOT member to go, but you do need to, um, I think we contact uh, the field trip members um, on the website. September 30th, we'll be back down to San Antonio uh, for a tour of the Botanical Garden, and October will be another uh, uh, survey at Hidden Springs. We're trying to hit over a few years every month out there so we get a kind of a, a, a feel of what blooms when out there. Thank you to all the volunteers that helped made our uh, plant sale this year a success. We had it at a different location this year down in Round Rock. Uh, there was a very impressive line of people waiting uh, at 10 o'clock when we opened. We had tons and tons of plants. We did sell out of a few things. We had a few things left over. Uh, it's always a, a learning curve, but it was, I think, a, an incredibly successful sale. And we also reached a part of the county that we don't always get to. So it was really nice to have it down there in Round Rock. Uh, very successful sale. And thank you to everybody that made it happen. And especially to the Round Rock High School Plant Club. The club. These guys are incredibly helpful. And where's Mark back there? Uh, these students uh, kind of put some of us to shame. They're enthusiastic, they're fast, energetic, and they know plant stuff backwards and forwards. And I credit that with their mentor, who is a member here. So thank you, Mark. Um, speaking of Round Rock High School, uh, they have a Monarch Way station, and these were images taken uh, today, yesterday, today, of the caterpillars that are about to form their chrysalis and turn into monarchs that are there uh, at the Round Rock High School. So, ah, munch away. Uh, we do need some volunteers to prep uh, some plants for the giveaway for Earth Day on April 22nd. Uh, we need people to help uh, put labels on bags and then put plugs in back April 20th and 21st. You can see Nancy Copperman at the back of the room waving back there or um, send an email to wilcochapter at nipsot.org if you're interested in helping. It's a lot of fun. Get to sit around and chat with people as you stuff plants. Uh, upcoming programs, May 11th will be Ricky Lennox, not one to miss. Medicinal applications of native plants, about a one hour presentation. June 8th, uh, Jim Bowden, living soil. These are really good. Uh, Jan uh, July 13th will be the annual meeting in 
Nacogdoches, I think. No. no. Oh, and, oh, I'm sorry. I, that's that's October, isn't it? The annual. Yes. Sorry, November. Sorry, August 10th, Adam Black on Native Orchids. Uh, September 14th, Colleen D Dieter, Central Texas Seed Savers. Open on October 12th. If you have a suggestion, please let us know your suggestion and we'll work on it. November 9th, Bill Carr, Academic Science versus Citizen Science. And that'll be kind of interesting too. So uh, if you know of a speaker, uh, please contact Susie Hickman. Uh, you can do that through the website. Thank you. Tonight, if you are here in person, our giveaways are mostly standing cypress. I have 16 standing cypress and we have four red columbine. Uh, those are free. Plus we have some other things that Mark, whose last name I cannot pronounce, uh, brought from the Round Rock uh, uh, High School garden. So we have some free plants in the back. And so for those of you online, you really should come to the in-person meeting because you get free plants. Um, an in-person attendee tonight will win a copy of our speaker's book, Texas Cacti, and I sure hope I'm the winner. Another reason to come to the in-person meeting. And finally, here's our, um, uh, all our contact information. We have a blog. The blog is our chapter newsletter. Uh, members and non-members can sign up for email notifications. We have a YouTube channel where we post uh, our, speaks, our, our speakers and our topics when we can. We have a Facebook page and we have an Instagram. So follow us, follow us. Uh, chapter meetings uh, are, will continue to be a hybrid of live and Zoom for those of you who do not want to travel here. Um, most of the recordings are posted on YouTube. If you are here in person, you are giving your consent to be videoed for Zoom and for YouTube. Uh, do make a note of where the meetings are. Every once in a while, the room here at the Georgetown Library is not available and we have to go elsewhere. So make sure you read where the meeting is going to take place place. And if you want to join NIPSOT or donate, you go to nipsot.org. There's 35 different chapters in the state of Texas. You can pick what chapter you want to support. And we are the Williamson County chapter. And tonight, our, oh, I'm sorry, I have one more, two more uh, announcements. First of all, uh, for Earth Day, uh, Vicki, whose last name I don't know, do you want to come Vicki uh, is going to host the booth, the Nipsot booth at the Gary Park Nature Fest. That's April 22nd from one to four. She needs a couple of volunteers to help her. You can contact her after the meeting. For those of you online, go through the website. Those of you in person, just talk to her. And uh, this Saturday, uh, April 15th from 10 to 2.30, the Hill Country Bloomers Garden Club is having a spring plant sale, uh, mostly some natives, some vegetables, uh, cacti, uh, and a selection of handmade jewelry, ceramic pots, and macrame. And uh, the address for that is the Milburn Park Pavilion, 1901 Sunchase Boulevard, Cedar Park. And I'll try to get uh, Aaron to put that in the chat so that we can all see that. So uh, tonight, pardon me? Oh, thank you. Oh, Gary will scan it in. So technological. Okay, so now that we've finished with all that, um, our speaker tonight is Brian Laughlin. He's an accomplished professional, professional photographer with more than, we won't say how many years, of professional experience in many specialized areas, including aviation. I was really impressed about that. His award-winning photographs have been, been published in international books, magazines, and other publications. He's a member of a number of uh, photography clubs and associations. I'm, I'm not gonna, you can read his website. I'm just gonna try to be brief because we're cutting into our time here. Uh, he and his wife uh, teach and conduct seminars and workshops and lead nature photography tours. He has a website. So uh, that was on earlier and I think I somehow got out of the sharing. Okay. Um, he is the author of the book that we're giving away tonight, uh, Texas Cacti. He's also the author and producer and photographer for grasses of the Texas Hill Country. And they have a, a book in uh, production, Texas Wildflower Vistas and Hidden Treasures. So we welcome Brian and uh, for his talk on cactus. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. 
<laughs> I've been here several times, I know, and it's nice to see familiar faces. I see a lot of new people and all, and it's great to be with native plant people. And I always say that because I like to be with native plant people. I like native plants. Um, the whole idea is that we've got a lot of cactus that are native plants, native to Texas. And I wanna to talk to you about them whenever we have a chance, okay? Now let's see if I can make this go forward. It works five minutes. <laughs> Here we go. As you can imagine, because of Texas size and our geographical diversity, we have an awful lot of different kinds of, all kinds of different plants, animals, um, all kinds of botanical and uh, other animal uh, products that grow everywhere. I'm gonna try to give you an overview of, of a lot of the cacti just while I'm babbling a little bit. But what I wanted to tell you a little bit about was that in doing this book on cactus, we traveled extensively through the state. We actually put 19,000 miles on our car when we were traveling, producing this book. And this doesn't sound so bad now, but gas was $4 a gallon. That was back, you know, way back when. And <clears throat> so um, Susie asked me earlier, she said, were all of these in the Trans-Pecos? And I said, absolutely not. Um, we spent a lot of time in a lot of different places from Galveston Island to all the way out to El Paso and the Franklin Mountains, clear up to um, the Capitol Reef and, and all over the entire state of Texas, except the Northern Panhandle, I guess, is probably the only place we didn't go. We have cactus in every part of the state. And so to get started, I wanna talk about what a cactus is. And a cactus basically is what botanically is called a stem succulent. Now you guys know the difference between a succulent plant and a woody plant. A succulent plant is one that probably holds water in its tissues for a large portion of time. And a woody uh, plant is one that transports water and, and nutrients through the plant all the times. So <clears throat> instead of being a leafy succulent, like some other plants, uh, like a jade plant, Cactus is a stem succulent. It holds all its water in the stem. And I'll show you the stem. A lot of people probably don't understand what a stem of a cactus is all about. But what's really interesting is all cacti are succulents, but all succulents are not cactus. Okay, so there's a real distinction there. And cactus are also what we call vascular plants. A vascular plant is one that has flowers, fruits, and seeds, roots, stems, and leaves, okay? So if you start from the bottom, we have sometimes woody roots, sometimes very, very diverse roots, and they spread. And the main thing is a vascular plant has vascular bundles. Now, you don't use the same word in the in the definition, right? So it's got these tubules, like we would call blood vessels in a human, that are used for transportation of water and nutrients throughout the plant. <laughs> so let's start with the anatomy. This is the stem. This is the pointer work. Yeah. Yep. All right. So. This is the stem of this particular cactus, okay? And it's rounded and it holds a lot of water. Now, guess what? In the Wiley Coyote movies you've seen in the old time cowboy westerns, they cut off the top and they got a drink, right? 
Well, you can't do that because the cactus is actually solid material. Uh, and I'll show you in, in just a minute. Here is a stem of a polymer cactus. And you can see that it is full. This is the uh, outer uh, layer of uh, tissue, which is in a cactus hardened to prevent water evaporation. And in the cortex, we have a lot of juicy gelatinous material. Now, if you were to take this real thin section that I made and use a particular stain, it would stain all the vascular tissue, the ones that hold the water, the liquid, okay? So we can see great amounts of vascular bundles right here in the center. We can, we can visualize this without the stain. We can see also some major vascular bundles, but water is transported throughout this whole thing by these vascular bundles. There is not a container of water on the inside of a cactus. Now, it's a vascular plant, so it has leaves. Now, what are leaves? Well, we've got two different kinds of cactus. We've got those that have persistent leaves. They have leaves on them all the time. This is called Pereschia. And this, this is a cactus leaf. This is the area where the uh, spines grow. These are the spines. And these leaves are on that plant all the time. Now, Pereschia has been extirpated from Texas. Used to be here down in the valley, uh, in some of those areas of the valley, like out near the coast and those kind of things. Prickly pear have leaves also. This is a prickly pear pad, which is a stem. These are the leaves. And prickly pear cactus has ephemeral leaves. In other words, they drop off after a certain period of time. When the pad is young or the stem is young, we have very, very young leaves. They do the photosynthetic process just like other leaves do. Uh, but yet, as that cactus gets older, the outer skin will photosynthesize and has no need for leaves any longer. Now, if you were to cut open a cactus flower, it's a little bit unlike most flowers that you've seen, okay? Because it contains all of the reproduction uh, components and anatomy in there, including the ovary, okay? So what happens is we have the pistil and then the stamen, all right? So, so the stamen contains the anther and the filaments and the pistil contains all the female reproductive parts in the same flower, okay? And as you notice down here, as the pollen is collected in the stigma, it runs down through the style in the tube into the ovary to be fertilized, and that turns into flowers, okay? Now, cactus have flowers of every color you can imagine, except blue. We don't know why that is, because we have fuchsia ones, we have green ones, we have yellow ones, and you would think if you could mix some of those up, you might get blue somewhere in there, but it doesn't occur, all right? So this is a, a kind of Cirrus brevimetus, which has a really, really nice, really big showy flower. And when you take a look at this, you can see the details that we were discussing about the flower. We have flowers that are actually green. Um, they are really, really green, and they're easy to spot because of their really interesting color. This is what's called the glory of Texas. This is Thelocactus bicolor, and it is one of the largest and most showy uh, cactus that we have that's native. The flower is probably nine inches in diameter, really, really big, and it 
color rise goes from, this is really poor with the light on here. It's magenta down here and it gets to be very, very, very light um, uh, magenta out toward the, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now you can see more of that color. And it's, it's really flaming down on the inside. This is a furrow cactus. Uh, <laughs> this is the largest cactus in Texas. Okay. Now we don't have the giant cactus like saguaros, like you see in Arizona, in the Tucson area and all that with the, um, uh, the saguaro national forest. But our pharaoh cactus gets possibly as tall as I am, like seven feet, right? <laughs> and they weigh 1,100 pounds. Um, I'll show you pictures of them with Shirley and me here in a minute. We have lots of really different uh, construction of cactus. And I'll show you some of the differences. Uh, this is a Coripantha. It's sometimes called a nipple cactus. Um, and we have Coripantha growing here in the hill country. So when we talk about the flowers as they mature, we started with the flower. And the flower was contained here on top of what will be the ovary. The flower matures as a flower. Now I'm talking about the flower. I'm not talking about a whole plant as a flower plant. I'm talking about the actual structure of the flower. And the reproduction goes on and it is carried down into this portion of the flower, which is a modified stem. Uh, and actually the whole thing is a modified bud. And so what happens is the fertilization takes place. Uh, the ovary begins to grow. We have no need for the flower components any longer and they dehisce and fall off. Now you've seen prickly pear with all of these guys on top. Okay, I'm gonna back up one slide. And if you notice, this portion right here is where the flower falls off. This is the flower scar. So this was the bud that turned into a stem that turned into the ovary. And now it is actually turned into the fruit. So the ovary itself becomes the fruit of a cactus. And they have lots and lots and lots of seeds. Opuntias or prickly pears have this style of seed, which is basically kind of a little flattened disc like, uh, say, tomatoes. Okay. And we went to a lot of these, we prepared jelly out of them, and we've actually taken some and we've cut them apart and counted all the seeds. We get an average of 450 seeds for each one of these type of fruit. If we look at the cirrus type, which is all the other cacti except jointed opuntias, you'll find maybe 30 seeds. It's a vast difference. And these seeds have a really, really hard coat. Somebody has equated this to looking like a helmet. I don't know how or why, but uh, it's very, very hard. And it has some tissue structures on the outside that give it some real coarse texture so it can wash down the, the road or wherever and uh, transport itself by wind and water erosion. Now, all cacti have a very special uh, structure called an areole. This is the areole. The areole is like a stem bud and it can give rise to another stem, a root 
or a flower, and therefore you can have from any aerial a complete plant. How many people have tried to eradicate the prickly pears in the yard and left part of it on the ground, and all of a sudden it's growing? It grows from the aerial. So the aerial give, can give root to any of those structures, just has to have a little bit of nourishment and a little bit of encouragement and off it goes. The aerials also give rise to the spines. And there's many, many different designs of cactus spines, which we'll talk about. So <clears throat> generally speaking with cactus, we have two different kinds of spines. We have a central spine, which doesn't need any explanation, and we have radial spines. But then when you really look at some cactus, we have in some forms, there are many central spines and maybe few radial spines, or it could be the other way around. So cactus spines is one of the unique descriptors that gives us the ability to, to differentiate one species from another is by the shape, color, number, and arrangement of the cactus spines. As you can see here, I've got a collection of many different cactus spines. This one is one you've seen all the time. It's in the garden outside, it's a prickly pear. We have ferrocactus, we have lace cactus, we have mammillarias, we have a hook spine cactus. All of these things are structures that help give rise to the differentiation between one plant and another, right? <clears throat> so why do we get hooked on cactus? And that's not a pun. A lot of people really, really like cactus. Um, Herville has got a really big active cactus club. I gave this presentation one time and was scared to death because I gave it at the Tucson, Arizona Cactus Club, and there were 400 people in the meeting. So why do we get hooked? We like the flowers. A lot of people like me who are photographers, I'm a, I'm a biologist by background. I'm a cell biologist. Uh, and I just got hooked on plants for some reason. I'm not a botanist per se, I'm a very big generalist. My specialty is things that are really, really tiny at the cellular level, but um, the flowers are very interesting. They're very photogenic, as are the spines. The spines are very interesting, even though they are not pleasant to be around. Uh, cactus have very, very interestingly diverse shapes, and you don't have to do anything to grow cactus. I think that's the biggest part of it. No fertilization, no water. You don't have to do anything. You got a weed around it, I guess, if you want to have a pretty garden. But the point is, I've got a friend in Riverside, California, that is a commercial cactus grower and nurseryman. And he says, on, when is it? Super Bowl, he waters his cactus. <laughs> And then he doesn't do anything else with them all year round. And he's propagating these plants. Once they're established, they grow very well. Now, nurturing them a little bit is required when you start to, um, to grow them, especially if you're growing from seeds and stuff like that. But once they're established, they'll grow anywhere. Now, <laughs> in Texas, we have about 22 different genera of cactus within the cactus family. I'm not gonna go through this list, but there are a good number of them. And I'm gonna show you pictures of many of them. Now I mentioned Pereschia before. Pereschia is, used to be called lemon vine or Selena cirrus, queen of the night. And both of these have been extirpated from Texas. I went to 
the Botanical Research Library of Texas, RIT in Fort Worth. And I got samples of Selena Cirrus. I knew that Pereski was gone. I got the samples of Selena Cirrus and I got samples of Pereskia. And I went to the coordinates where these plants were found that are in the library. There were cotton fields by um, uh, Edinburgh, Texas. Way far south Texas from Edinburgh over to the coast is where these plants grew. And they've all been turned into farmland. So we've lost a lot of them. Now, I happen to have a Selena cirrus myself, which I brought from somewhere else and is growing up my oak tree in my backyard, but it is cultivated. It's not wild. It used to be. Um, but the point is, most of them are in various stages of protection throughout the state. We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about cactus shapes first before I get into that, because we devised a way to segregate our book into sections, which for a lay person made a lot of sense to be able to differentiate one kind of a cactus from another. Now, you probably understand that in the plant and animal world, you can take what's called a dichotomous key and follow a path of twin um, characteristics down to get to the actual genus and the species of a plant or animal. What happened? What? They don't need to see me. They need to see the screen. And we can't see the color of the screen with the lights on. Sorry. So nobody needs me. <laughs> I'm just here to make noise. No, so the thing of it is, is <clears throat> a dichotomous key is built like two sections. All right. Is it green or is it blue? Okay, it's green. Does it have long pointy leaves or does it have rounded leaves? Well, it's got rounded leaves. Do the rounded leaves have hairs on them or not? They don't have hairs. So you're leading down this two dichotomous, that's what that means, pairs of questions and answers to get to the end of the road that gets you to the actual genus and species. And somewhere along the way, you'll screw up and you have to go back up to line 13 and start all over again. So we decided that we realized cactus have very definitive um, stem shapes. Okay, here's three of them. We have the angular shape, uh, those that have no visible means of self-supporting and they have to clamber up or grow like a vine in other plants, or we have cylindrical shapes. So here's a cylindrical one, okay? All right, so that's three. Three more is we have those that are flattened and never become spherical. Then we have those that are opposite of that, which are always spherical, but they may be uh, small or large, depending on the season and the drought conditions. And then we have those that have very distinct ribs to them. And a rib in a cactus is a, a structure like an accordion. Remember I told you that cactus hold water in their stems? If that stem wasn't elastic in some ways, then it would rupture if it got too much water in it. And so what happens now is that instead of doing that, the stem has these ribs, which gives it the ability to expand without stretching the tissue. And that gives us the ability to store more and more water. This is a ferrocactus that we were talking about. And then we have segmented cactus. None of the previous ones you have are segmented. So we have 
flat segmented, which we know of as prickly pears. We have round segmented, which we know of as choya. And then we have mat forming segmented cacti, which are also a form of choya. They don't have a lot of definition. They just grow like a mess on the ground. All right. So I'll take some cacti questions at this point right now uh, from anything that I've talked about before. And then we'll go on to some other things about cactus. You, have, you talked about your cactus shapes. You have cylindrical, and then you also have ribs. Uh-huh. The cylindricals have, in the cylindrical form, they have no ribs. And the ribbed are definitely ribbed. Uh, go back a couple of pictures here. See the, see the ribs here? Uh huh. And the cylindrical, there are no ribs in this plant. Okay. That's the differentiation. Anybody else? Anybody in the room? Anybody in the chat? Chat. Um, how can you tell varieties of a potia prickly pear, and which one is a potia agomania? Any distinctive features? <laughs> Good question. The question was, how do you distinguish opuntias, prickly pears, uh, from one another in the varieties? And how can you tell opuntia ingomaniae? Okay, that's it kind of succinctly, right? In Texas, we have 56 species of prickly pear all of which happen to be the state plant of Texas. You know, the, the, the people in Congress don't know anything about botany, right? So they said, oh, prickly pear is a state, uh, state plant, right? The question is, which one? All of them, all right? So among the 56, the question is, how can you tell the difference between Opuntias, and let's call them platypuntias, the real scientific name, meaning flattened stems, okay, of which Opuntia ingomaniae and Lindheimeri are both members. The only way you can definitively tell is by counting chromosomes and doing DNA studies. However, for the layperson, there are some particular differences in the stem uh, formation and particularly the spine formation on the aerials. And I'll show you some pictures about that. So in the early days, before we had DNA, we could actually squash the tissue and we could see cells and we could count chromosomes in there. And so we have a certain number. Some of them have 32, some of them have 64, and those kind of things. So we divide them into 2N and 4N and those kind of things. Now we can actually take any kind of tissue and extract DNA from it, and we can sequence DNA and really tell the difference between them. That's it for you with your question online. Um, and I'll talk to you in a minute about Ingomanii versus then Hymeri. Okay, next question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that from It is not. Um, and I'm going to explain that. You notice what it says on the bottom left hand corner. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So now I want to talk about where can you find cactus. I, I've got. In my list of things, I have three of the most important, four of the most important um, gardens that have cactus in the world. The first is the Kew Gardens in London. Okay, so that's not very much accessible to us on a regular basis. If you want to go to California uh, near Pasadena, you can go to the Hunting, Huntington Gardens 
and they've got an absolutely great desert garden out there, which has got Texas natives, California natives, Mexico natives, cactus from all over the native world. And guess where the native world for cactus is? In the Americas. There are no cactus that are native to either Europe, Asia, or Africa. Although they grow there now because people have transported them and they're growing everywhere. All right, so this is a picture of part of the cactus garden in Huntington and this young lady asked about the golden barrels. Uh, golden barrels are found in California and Arizona and way down in Mexico all over. And they sell them in Austin, America for landscaping. And I'll show you the pictures of that. Didn't make much sense, but now <clears throat> my buddy behind me says the best cactus garden that he's ever been to is the Phoenix Desert Botanical Gardens. And I would say, yes, that's really true. What happens is instead of using imported cactus, all of the cactus there, except perhaps some on display, are native to Arizona. And they are in a native setting with walkways through the native setting. Now, they've been planted, they've been rearranged, they are maintained and all that kind of stuff to keep them healthy, but these are all native cacti. Now, I see plants right here that are not cactus. Those are agaves. So don't get agaves and yuccas mixed up with cactus. Also in Arizona, we have the Saguaro National Park, which is just a little bit north of Tucson. And here's where we do find the giant saguaro. Um, and the park is, of course, named for that. And if you want to see some, you can go here and see plenty. Now, let's talk about Texas. Texas is about 300,000 square miles of diverse biological habitat. It ranges from sea level, you know, near the coast to nearly 9,000 feet at Guadalupe Peak. And during all of this is a really big, broad mix of vegetative habitat, okay? We have nearly 4,000, nearly 5,000, 4,800 species of vascular plants, and I think 22 genera of cactus with some break down to 150 some odd species. Now, they range from dime sized plants at maturity to those that are weighing about 1,100 pounds. And I'll show you pictures as we go along about uh, cactus in their native habitat. So, if we drove from Orange, Texas to El Paso, we would go like on Interstate 10, we'd go about 880 miles, which also, if you went from Tex line down to Brownsville is also about 880 miles. So if we didn't have that irregularity, our, our state would be square, but we're so different, we couldn't be possibly square. So if, if we went from one side to the other, it takes about 13 hours to go across if we're going at speed limits. But what's interesting is we're gonna go through six major changes in vegetative areas and eight different floristic regions within those because of the very diverse habitat we're going to cross, the diverse elevations, and the change in the weather. Now, these are the vegetative areas of Texas. You may have seen this in a lot of different places. It's a very important tool for people who are uh, thinking about plants and plant origins and plant growth. Um, and so from the coast, you have, or let's say the East Texas border, you have the piney woods and you go clear out to the Trans-Pecos and you grow from uh, the South Texas Plains all the way up through the Panhandle or the High Plains. Now, those areas that have the most diversity of 
of cactus are those that I've listed in red. South Texas Plains, the Edwards Plateau, believe it or not, and then again, the Trans-Pecos. And in the reverse order, Trans-Pecos, Hill Country, and South Texas. This is cactus habitat. Does it look like much? Not much of a growth system here, but you can see if you got down on your hands and knees, probably 25 or 30 different species of cactus in this one particular photograph. This is down near Big Bend. Um, this is also near Big Bend. The Rio Grande River is right behind me. And this is a very special um, <clears throat> Opuntia prickly pear. This is at a famously known place for botanists called Mile 13 on the river that goes from, um, let's say, um, Terlingua to um, Presidio, I guess. Um, and that's one of the largest groups of prickly pears that, that I've ever seen in doing the work on the book. Now, this is a common scene in our Chihuahuan Desert. This happens to be in Big Bend, okay? So we have, in the picture, we have prickly pear cactus, obviously. We have creosote bush in the lower right-hand corner, which is one of the indicator plants of the Chihuahuan Desert. And we also have creosote bush out here and over here, other indicator plants of the Chihuahuan Desert. So the Chihuahuan Desert has a big influence on our vegetation in the southwest corner of, of Texas. The southwest corner of Texas is an arid desert grassland. And because of that, we have arid cactus, we have grassland cactus as well. And here we've got a wide variety of cactus in this photograph. In the high plains, we have cactus as well as in the hill country. And here's some growth of cactus in these piles right here. In the piney woods, we have cactus. In South Texas scrub, not only do we have cactus that will prick you, we have everything else that will poke you, bite you, stick you, or somehow or other will grab you and won't let go. So we have uh, yuccas, agaves, cactus. Uh, we have acacias and all kinds of plants that have thorns on them. Now, the floristic regions are listed, and we have all of those floristic regions within Texas, but the Chihuahuan Desert Scrub and the Tamulipan Desert Scrub that I just showed you are the two most prolific floristic regions when it comes to cactus. Now, here's part of the reason. We have this large desert area. We've got the Chihuahuan Desert. We have over further west, we have the Sonoran Desert, which doesn't affect Texas much, but the Chihuahuan Desert covers a big portion of, you know, the Trans-Pecos and all that area, and a couple of little isolated uh, areas in the three or four counties up here near uh, Guadalupe Peaks and Guadalupe Mountains. And it goes all the way up into New Mexico. So this arid desert region has a great influence on a lot of the vegetative plants and animals that we find in West Texas. And this is Big Bend. This is what Big Bend naturally looks like in a lot of places. This is stratified, what's called Bokeas limestone. And it contains lots and lots of different cactus. In this picture, this great big thing right here is one cactus. These are cacti. Um, there's cacti in here. Uh, all of these are cactus. Uh, these are all, I think, um, creosote bushes, uh, but we got lots of cactus in here. Now, like I said, 
we have a consideration about conservation of our plants and animals in Texas. And we have a categorization of these stages of threatened or endangered or rare kind of plants. And they run from S1, which is the most severely uh, impacted, I guess, or rare to secure, okay? Now in the cactus book that somebody's gonna win, uh, all the plants have a designation as to their conservation status. All of them are S4 or better, except prickly pear. Now, what does that mean? That means it is illegal in Texas to dig, transport, or transplant cactus in Texas. Everybody does it. Now, there's reasons not to do it. Number one, it's illegal. I'll tell you about others. Now, totally secure, S5, prickly pear. A lot of people got to get rid of prickly pear. You know, you've got to, let's say you've got a pasture and you're really going to have some livestock in your pasture. You really want to get that out of there. So what do you do? Well, there are some chemicals that are now listed available for prickly pear that are herbicides that will kill it. But a lot of people go and chop it down and they put it in big piles and burn it. When they chop it down, they scatter the aerials everywhere and it grows up again. Where's the lady that lives by, um, what's the name of the road of the bandit? Sam Bass Road. Who's the lady that lives by Sam Bass Road? Okay. If you drive from Sam Bass Road on 1431 over to I-35, you can see some fields on the right and the left, and there's little bitty prickly pear all over everywhere. Guess what? They removed them. They thought. But they didn't. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's talk about cactus that are threatened in Texas. Number one, Astrophytum asterius, or sometimes called starfish cactus or um, other things. Uh, it grows in Star County only nowadays, and it is a S1. Also Sclerocactus mariposensis, and it gets its name from the Mariposa Mines in Big Bend. That's where it was first found. And it's found only within maybe a five or eight mile radius of that area. That's also S1, rare. Echinocerus chisosensis. The Chisos Mountains in Big Bend is home to this cactus on the left. And it is always found within nurse plants, and I'll show you pictures of nurse plants so you understand that in a minute. Um, and it's along both sides of the highway from, let's say the headquarters down toward Cottonwood campgrounds. Um, and that's the only place it's found in Texas. And guess what's on the right? It's called Lophophoria williamsii, which is called peyote. And peyote is illegal to obtain or to uh, maintain or to do anything with unless you are a licensed peyotero, which is a member of a designated Indian tribe that is one of the few people that are allowed by federal law to obtain and to use peyote in a hallucinogenic um, native ritual. It is a hallucinogen, and that's why not only is it covered by USDA, the plants people, but it's also covered by DEA, the drug people, because it is a hallucinogenic drug. Escobaria minima is a very, very small cactus. It's about the size of a pool ball. 
Okay, and the flower covers the uh, thing, and it's found only in one small place in Texas, which is south of Marathon. And it is on, I can't remember her name, Susan something. She used to be the state controller. Uh, it's, Cole? huh? Susan Combs? Yeah, thank you. It's only found on her ranch because there is an eruption of a particular mineral that this plant grows in. It's called naviculite. And it and several other plants are indigenous and endemic to that particular noviculite outcropping. The only other noviculite outcropping in the United States is in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So that's a long way away and we don't really have that cactus over in Hot Springs. Now we have this cactus on the right. Whoops. Sorry about that, let's go back. Um, it's another sclerocactus, Brevahomatus, but the variety is Tobushii. It's Tobush fishhook cactus. It grows only in the county where Kerrville is and two or three counties right around that. And I have a friend who is with Texas Parks and Wildlife that counts and monitors these plants and there are only 1,300 of them. And under these rocks are little aluminum tags with numbers on them. One for this plant and one for that plant and one for every other plant that she finds as they grow. Now, <clears throat> I'll show you a picture of this later on that you can hardly tell it's a cactus because it is so obscured by the grass that it normally grows in. This is limestone over here. This is at, at the Kerr, uh, Kerr um, State Wildlife Management Area, just west of um, Kerrville. This is what our desert looks like. Our Chihuahuan Desert is not a desert of sand dunes. It's a desert of rocky floors and grasslands. And you say, how would anything grow in here? And it grows just like this. Every one of these little fissures and pockets can catch a seed or a little seedling of a plant and it'll take hold and come the first and next rain, it will start sprouting. And we have in our Chihuahua Desert, what we call two springs. We have our early spring, which is, you know, regular springtime, February, March, April. And then it gets real hot and dry. But then it rains again in the fall and we have a second spring and everything starts blooming again. So if you ever wanna see blooming in Big Bend, go as early as February, uh, March or April, and then stay away Unless, unless you really like the heat until uh, October and, and only if we've had a couple of good rains. This is what our floor looks like in Travis and Bandera County, right? Solid limestone. Everybody in here has solid limestone in their yard and you got maybe two or three inches of topsoil on it and then you hit bedrock when you're trying to plan something, right? Well, like the other Chihuahuan desert floor, little pockets can capture just enough water and a little seedling to get something to grow. This is the towbush fishhook cactus. It's rare, threatened, and endangered. All right, so how can you be successful in finding cactus and understanding cactus. Okay. Do your research, of course, and use all your resources, which are groups like you guys, Native Plant Association, uh, cactus clubs, and all that kind of stuff. But the biggest thing is patience, perseverance, and persistence. 
I told you we spent, I've forgotten. Are we doing on time? Hmm? Okay. Huh? Okay. I've got two, five more, 15, five. <laughs> so there are a lot of references that you can get. These are the famous references. These are the very best of the books on cactus. And there are some here that are also very, very good, including one that I can spy right here. <laughs> now, <clears throat> there's a guy named Michael Powell who wrote yeah. this book. Michael Powell used to be a professor. He's emeritus at Saul Ross in Alpine. And after I came out with this book, he took this book, which is a big Bible, and he reduced it to this book, trying to make it into a field guide. It's still too onerous, really, for a field guide. And believe it or not, there's a guy in Minnesota that's got a book in here on cactus. And I don't know what he did or how he went about doing it, but don't have a lot of cacti in Minnesota. But there are cacti in every state in the United States and Canada, and all the way down to Puerto de Fuego down in Argentina. So we've got cactus everywhere. These are some references. These are places you can go. These are state parks. All state parks have cactus. If you add to the state parks, the state wildlife management areas, some of which are open to the public, and others that are not, but welcome you if you make a phone call and say, can I come? Say, sure. So you can go out there and find cactus and, and uh, photograph them and enjoy them too. Big. Here, you wipe out half of those? <laughs> no, you know what? It's an excellent question. And I would say probably not. Yeah, because of the diversity of the cactus that we actually have. Uh, Big Bend, of course, is the number one place to go. Uh, Guadalupe National Park, Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge, because it's in that Tamalipas thorn scrub area, uh, Laguna Atascosa, all there, um, and all the other stuff. And of course, you recognize the fact that over 90% of the land in Texas is privately owned. So if you have buddies with land or things you want to share with the Native Plant Society of Texas, then, hey, you know, it's a good thing. Now, I've got one more thing I'll do and we'll quit. Finding a cactus is like finding a dime in the desert. And I told you how difficult it was to find. Patience and persistence pays off. There is a cactus called Boke's Button. And it is literally a dime-sized cactus at maturity literally 18 millimeters wide. Shirley and I hunted for it and hunted for it and hunted for it. And toward the end of our book, we went to a particular location where something else was to be found. I opened the car door and almost stepped on one. So finding a cactus in this stuff is really, really tough. This is the Boke's button. They're really tiny. Some of them are big. And there's some of these. This is the Ferrocactus was Lindsayi that is bigger than I am. Um, they're cryptic. They are really hard to find. This is Bokeas limestone. And this is a mammalaria uh, sitting right here. And it's hard to find until sometimes they flower. And then you can find them when they're flowering. Uh, Cactus are also cryptic. This is the uh, Asterius, Astrophytum Asterius. This is not a cow patty. This is called Areocarpus fissuratus or stone cactus. And it just looks like that until it blooms. Now look at the difference between the stem, that's the stem here, and the stem when it is during its blooming season, whoops, lost my control here. I'm going crazy. Uh, it's full of water now. And it says, oh, I'm full of water. I need to reproduce, right? 
So it does really good. Cactus or cam camouflage. This is Tobu this is a uh, Tobush fish hook cactus. Okay. This is the way it looks if you have a grassland. Hard to find in there. We found it only by following some bees. This is cactus seeking natural protection. We call these nurse plants. Nurse plants give cactus several things. They give them shade. They give them extra water because they collect water from rain and it filters down through their root systems and the cactus benefits from it. And it prevents erosion from in either wind or water. We can have cactus growing among other cactus, which are nurse plants. This is uh, the Chisocensis and a Coriopuntia, which is one of the crawling choyas. Okay. And in and under other nurse plants where there are many other hazards. This is Colorado Bend State Park, by the way. Uh, and of course, lots of critters live in cactus. This is a cactus wren. This is North America's largest wren. Lives in a uh, grass, little grass uh, nest that it builds within the security of prickly pear. And I noticed this scarring here as I drove by this prickly pear several times and I noticed the nest and I said, this is an active nest. So I went and camouflaged myself across the little drive and then the bird finally came. This is a hunter ant going through um, uh, a cactus looking for food. These are the bees and the uh, hill bush fish hook cactus and an uh, ambush predator. Uh, this is an assassin bug, and it's probably caught a bee because bees like those things. And of course, we have little miniature jumping spiders that are really, really fun. So I'm going to stop here since it's time, and I can take a couple more questions from either direction. Yes, sir, ma'am. Or indicator plant, or is that indicator plant that grew in the Chihuahua Desert? Uh huh. They only grow there. No, they grow everywhere. No, they don't grow everywhere. They grow other places. But what an indicator plant is is a plant that is, I would say, frequently and more commonly found associated in a particular vegetative zone, and we in the desert both Chihuahuan and Sonoran, we have these chrysoph plants. And in the Chihuahuan, we also have the, um, uh, the, the form of yucca, which is a... Uh, no, that's not an indicator plant. Oh, um, Lechuguilla, yes, yes. I, I thought agave first and that, that got me confused. Well, what, what people think are, um, what's the big, long, stocky plant, woody plant? Soto. Soto. Uh, Ocotillo. Ocotillo is not an indicator plant. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, all, all mammalarias basically have that same characteristic. <laughs> um, look at look at the book real quick. There's a bunch of mammalarias in there. Maybe you can. And, and the the point is, what does the little um, nipples look like, right? And what does the spine formation look like? Okay. All mammalarias, when they flower, they turn into red fruit. So I can't. Can't go any further than that. Yeah. Okay. Questions on the chat. Yeah. Um, how big a threat is cactus moss? How big what? I think it was threats. 
We have finally discovered cactus moth in Texas in the area near um, Beaumont. Um, in states where it's prevalent, it's a big threat. In our state, it's not. It's being monitored really well. So did you get that? You think? OK. Um, can we eat cacti in wet parts? Yes. <laughs> Go for it. All parts. Now, anybody ever have nopalitos with their scrambled eggs? All right, you're eating the stem of a prickly pear. And they're quite good, especially when they're young. Now, cactus, like other plants, as they get older, they can turn a little bit woody. And when that happens, the tissue is not palatable much anymore. Go ahead. What are cactus root systems like? Root systems. Root systems. What are cactus root systems like? Mostly the root systems of cactus are very diverse. They're very, very fine and spread out. And the reason for that is they grow in the arid land. And because of that, they need to be able to soak up as much water as possible. So even these very big, big cactus, you don't see tap roots per se. You see a very fibrous uh, root system that's spread out. Okay. Well, we've kind thank of you. gone over time. So thank you so very much. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, that ends the meeting for those of you on Zoom. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube in the future. So good night to those of you on Zoom. <laughs>